it's raining. The spookiest of all weather phenomenon is rain. So we're going to end this week with some spooky stories. First off, I'm whispering. I'm whispering for this intro. First off, a man in Japan is just looking to make a few extra dollars. Instead, he turns himself into a suicide expert. Then we travel to Indiana to meet a four-year-old boy who wakes up one night as a gray alien is standing in his room. The alien's message to the boy, we're going to take one of your siblings tonight. Then we travel to the Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia, where a woman tells a terrifying story of a boating incident with her family. They just wanted to have a picnic on the edge of the swamp. Instead, they found themselves trapped in another reality. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys have an awesome weekend coming up. I'm actually, uh, this is my new, my weekend. I quit nicotine, full stop. I, I was supposed to quit it. I wasn't supposed to quit it. I was supposed to cut it down. And then I slowly saw it creeping up. Nope, I'm done. So my weekend is going to suck. My weekend is going to be a bunch of nicotine withdrawals. I'm actually going to record some episodes up so I can have a long weekend. You guys won't miss any episodes, but I'll get to relax. Super spooky raining right now. And I'm going to warn you guys, this episode is spooky. So I hope you guys brought your spooky pants. And one person who I know brought their spooky pants is one of our legacy Patreon supporters, Catherine Bellingham. Everyone give a round of applause to Catherine Bellingham. She's showing off her spooky pants, spooky jacket, spooky monocles. She, you know, There's only one monocle. But she has a spooky monocle and then an extra one in her pocket. She is all decked out for the spookiness. Catherine, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the Patreon, you know what I'm going to say. Just help spread the word about the show. That really, really helps out a lot. Catherine, I'm going to go ahead and give you the keys to the Dead Rabbit Dirigible. We are leaving behind Dead Rabbit Command, and we are headed out to Japan. Dirigible's flying nice and slow. I'm looking for something to put in my mouth. I'm looking, I'm putting in a sweets and candy and everything. Oh my god, this weekend's going to suck. What I've been doing is I've been balling up tissue paper and stuffing it in my gums. It's so funny when people see me do that, it, it really makes them mad. They go, that's so, they can't imagine, I'm doing it right now. They go, I can't imagine what it's like to have a Starbucks, you know how Starbucks napkins are really coarse? I'm going to roll it up and fold it so it's like a pouch of tobacco. I lick it with my tongue. Stick it in my gums. People go, it really irritates people when I do it. Because they just imagine how coarse that must be on the gums. But see, that's the point. Don't ever get addicted. Don't ever become an addict of anything. Definitely don't become an addict. Don't become something on top of a house. But don't become a drug addicted person like myself. Catherine, Catherine's just like, where am I supposed to drive this thing? She sees me picking up more, more tissue paper. No, no, no. You're going to head out to the city of Zama. That's in the Kangawa Prefecture in Japan. The year is 2017. And Japan, it's, it's in, Japan's interesting because when you, what's the first thing of you think of when you think of Japan? Okay, not that. Not the anime. Okay, not that either. Not the tentacle porn. No, not that. Not the vending machines full of the girls' underwear. Keep thinking. Exactly. Uh, you know, keep thinking. Not the samurai, not the sumo guys. Keep going down. Suicide. Suicide rates. You always think, you're like, Jason, that's so far down the list. That's so, you're still thinking of giant robots. Uh, suicide. And, and there's a thing, there's kind of a stereotype that Japan has a high suicide rate. Actually, the country that has the highest suicide rate is Greenland. I had a story I was going to do on it, but it was way too depressing. Greenland has the highest suicide rates in the world, really per capita, and they think it has to do with the sun not shining all the time, or indigenous people having to move off their lands and go into the city, and then after like two generations, they're like, this sucks, and they're blowing their brains out. It's this whole, it's like an epidemic. Greenland actually has more suicides than Japan. But Japan's kind of known for the suicides. It comes up all the time in stories, like the sun does something bad, like it's a serial killer. We covered that a long time ago, the otaku killer. The dad killed himself because he was ashamed of his son. That was in Japan. And Japan knows that they have that reputation, so they're actually really trying to crack down on suicide. They're really trying to convince people, young and old, men and women alike, that that's not the answer. Because it's not. 
But in Japan, there was a Twitter user named at Hanging Pro. And he began trolling Twitter looking for women who were lonely and alone and sad and ready to make that final step toward suicide. And he would give them that extra little push. Now, it's not like the Blue Whale game, which we covered in an episode a long time ago, where he would be like, oh, yeah, do it, do it. He would actively invite them over to his house and say, we can hang ourselves together. I'm the hanging pro. I've done this several times before. And they're like, wait, 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 you're still alive. How can you be the hanging pro if you're still alive? And his eyes go from side to side. He's like, uh, don't worry about that. Just come over to my place. We'll take a suicide pact and we'll both kill each other at the same time or kill ourselves at the same time. What happens is this woman goes missing. This 23-year-old woman goes missing. And the family calls the police. The police show up. They go to her computer. They're trying to figure it out. And they see that she has recently been talking to At Hanging Pro, also known as Takahiro Shiraashi. He's a 30-year-old man across town in the Zama, in the town of Zama. So the police show up at at this dude's house. And Takahiro is just kind of sitting there eating bugles or something like that. And the cops walk in and they're like, hey, dude. Um, what do you know about this missing woman? And he's like, I don't, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. There's like nooses everywhere. All of his stuff is decorated in nooses. He's wearing a tie in the shape of a noose. He's like, oh, I'm just hanging, bro. I'm just hanging around. That's my hobby. The cops go, it's a little suspicious that you love nooses. You love hanging. And this woman who was depressed came to your house. And he's just sitting there eating bugles. To be fair, I don't know exactly what he was eating. I just like the visual of him eating bugles for some reason. Product placement, give me money bugles. As the cops are investigating him, they're like, can I use your restroom? And he's like, yeah, sure. The guy has to walk through a beaded curtain of made of nooses. He pushes him aside. They find nine decapitated bodies in his apartment. And he's like, I probably should have moved this around. I shouldn't have kept eating those bugles. I shouldn't have got up and get a glass of orange juice. I probably should have moved those bodies. Nine decapitated bodies in this apartment. There's eight women and one man. So the cops arrest him. He's like, no, my bugles as they're carrying him away. They throw him in jail. Now, here's his thing. He goes, listen, I didn't commit a crime. These people wanted to kill themselves. I'm the hanging pro. I have a reputation to uphold. I just helped them kill themselves. The police are like, well, okay, that's all fair. But we can tell, even from your own confession you gave us, that they fought back pretty vigorously. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were like biting and scratching me and kicking me and like throwing lamps. I had to buy a bunch of lamps. But that's just that's just what happens when you strangle someone with a noose. Don't you know that, police officer? Don't you, haven't you ever done that before? They're looking at each other. He goes, so yeah, they fought back, but that's just like a natural response. The cops go, okay, fair. But then we checked out the women when we we're doing an autopsy. You know we're going to do an autopsy, right? And then he gulps. Uh. The women were actually sexually assaulted as well. And Takahiro goes, yeah, I don't have a reasonable answer for that part. And then the guy, so there was the eight women and then one man, the guy showed up and they go, well, he didn't talk to this dude on Twitter at all. He didn't want to kill himself. He seemed to be having a pretty cool life, apparently. Why'd you kill him? And Takahiro goes, yeah, okay, so the man didn't want to commit suicide. He actually showed up at this apartment because his female friend went missing. So he went there to find out what happened to his friend, and Takahiro murdered He murdered all of them. Whether or not they wanted to commit suicide, he murdered all of them. But even his idea of being an angel of mercy, he raped the women, and the man didn't want anything to do with suicide. He was actually there to help his friend, and he got killed anyways. This was a long-running scam, and this just kind of shows the sickness of crime. He started off just ripping off elderly women, which, which, is, a hard, which is a bad place to start, right? Crime, you always start at a certain level, and it's downhill from there. Usually, you start off like stealing your dad's watch, and then you start stealing bigger and better things. The next thing you know, you're driving a sports car with a safe strapped to it through Brazil. That's the escalation. You start off scamming elderly, depressed women, and then he thinks, wait a second, suicidal women are even more likely to be manipulated? And then he starts targeting suicidal women, but he wasn't killing them at this point. He was just stealing their money. And you're like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You, you, you want to kill yourself anyways, and now you're just broke. I'm not, that's not, a, <laughs> I'm not giving you advice on why this crime works. 
But that was his idea. And then one of the women that he stole from, I guess, paid him a visit. And he was afraid she was going to demand the money back. So he killed her. And then after that, he realized, oh, I can steal their money and then kill them. And then I don't ever have to worry about them filing a charge of robbery. The nine murder charges <laughs> might be a little worse, but the robbery charges, I will get away scot-free. Just this month, he received the death penalty. So that piece of work is going to get his head chopped off. I don't know. How do they kill people in Japan? Is it uh, lethal injection? Firing squad? But anyways, they're going to kill him. Catherine, Catherine's like, damn it, why did I wear my spooky pants for that depressing story? Catherine, let's go ahead and hop in the Dead Rabbit Dreadnought. We're going to do a little palate cleanser as you have on an awesome spooky pirate outfit. We're taking our massive battleship, a Tremere style with all the people rowing the oars and everything. Back to the United States, we're going to have a party because that story was super depressing. So we're doing a little dance. We're doing a little do do a dance for three months. That's how long it takes for us to get back to America. But we're finally back. We're headed to Kitley Woods, Indiana. It's 1983, and it's at night. So, oh, oh, oh. That's an owl. And then, like, doves. They're, um, they're, they were up all night. They were up all night dancing with us. And now they're back in Indiana, and now they're going to sleep. But they're still making some noise. We're walking up to a house, and in this house, we have a mother named Debbie and her four-year-old son, who we will name Roger. So Debbie and Roger are sleeping. It's nighttime. <laughs> they probably would have gone to sleep earlier if it wasn't for those doves dancing outside and making all that noise. But Debbie finally gets some sleep, and then she hears her four-year-old son, Roger, go, Mommy, 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 Mommy. And he's, she's like, I'm oh, not this irritating kid. <laughs> And she gets out of bed, she walks over to his room, and he's freaking out. And he goes, Mom, Mom, you won't believe what just happened. I was laying in bed. And right there, right there, he's pointing. You can see what I was doing. I was pointing on podcast. I saw a man, a little man with a large head. He walked through the wall. And then he just stood in the darkness of my room. Even though I'm four, <laughs> even though I'm four, my voice got all slow and spooky. He stood there in the darkness of my room, and I got a telepathic message from him. He said, I'm going to take one of the other children tonight. Roger then goes, I was a little puzzled. One, because this man, <laughs> man was able to walk through a wall. Can I do that, Mommy? Can I do that? And she's like, no, Roger. And he's like, dang it. This man walked through a wall. Also... He said he was going to take one of the other children, but I don't have any brothers or sisters, right? And the mom's like, uh, not in mom's eyes go from side to side. She's like, no, Roger, you're the only one. But he goes, I don't have any brothers and sisters, right? She's like, no, no. And he goes, and then the weirdest thing happened. It, that, that wasn't the weirdest part. I was paralyzed. The dude was somehow able to paralyze me. And then he walked into my closet. And I think he's still in there. I think he's still in my closet. So, Roger, I, I, looking at my notes, Roger actually left his room and came to the mom's room he, after the paralyzation ended. Because what happens is, the, Debbie, the mom, she goes to figure out what's going on. Because as an adult, you're thinking, my son's an idiot. Like, of course, that's not possible, right? Little man, big head, asking for his siblings and stuff like that, disappearing, paralyzation. As adults who are into this stuff... We're totally down with it. If your friend goes, hey, dude, you won't believe what happened last night. Little man, don't see that story again. You'd be like, what? You'd be kind of jealous. But if your kid was saying it, your kid's also saying that his best friend is Princess Peach and someday he's going to be a hang glider when he grows up. So you know your kid's an idiot. All kids are idiots. So when like a four-year-old's saying it, you're just kind of rolling your eyes. But she goes into the bedroom. She's getting ready to be like, Roger, you dork. There's nothing in here. And when she opens the door to his room, she sees a bright flash, and she sees a shadow fade out. So that's a weird combination of things. She walks in the room, and whatever was there disappeared in a flash, but the shadow stayed for a few seconds after the object is gone, and then that also disappears. An interesting story, but it's not the end. Because the alien made a promise. It was going to take one of the other children tonight. That night, Debbie said... She went to bed, and in the middle of the night, she woke up, and she was on some sort of operating table. And she says a gray-skinned, large-eyed entity, i.e. a gray alien, walks up to her and begins to pat her belly. And it asks, how do you feel? Hmm? 
I don't know if he said that. I don't know if it was Urkel. But he goes, how do you feel as he's patting her stomach? She feels bloated in her midsection. And she notices that her nightgown is hiked up around her thighs. She wakes up the next morning, suffering from ovarian pain, just cramps. Oh, my stomach and everything that's in there. And what's listed as a, quote, unusual vaginal discharge. I got this story from thinkaboutitdocs.com. It's really brief. I think it's super interesting. I do have to say, in the story, it does not say whether or not Roger has other brothers and sisters. But you could read it either way. Let's say that that Roger did have, like, a little brother. And the alien's like, I'm going to take one of your siblings. And Roger's like, yeah, hey, that little dork. Take him, take him. It's still interesting that he went for Debbie's uterus. But it doesn't say, like, if someone showed up at your house and says, I'm going to take one of your kids tonight... You'd call the cops, and you'd be alarmed, obviously, unless you have a super dorky kid, and you're like, I hope you think this one, you're pushing him out. But you wouldn't think the guy would come in and start taking ovaries out of your wife. Like, he's like, oh, no, I'm talking about theoretical children at this point. I thought it was interesting, the alien showed up and told the kid that in the first place, and then the mom had that nightmare, and then had the physical symptoms. And what would, why was there that chain of events? Why did the alien show up and tell the boy in the beginning? Did he try warning him? Is it two separate factions of greys? I mean, it's not really good warning. He could have, he could have warned the mom, hey, some guy's going to sneak in your room tonight and abduct you. But yeah, just a weird story all around. Some weird phenomenon going on with that one. They did eventually really take one of his siblings. It was just a sibling who hadn't been born yet, which actually kind of makes it creepier. Catherine Bellingham. Catherine's like, damn, why am I in this episode? Because you're awesome, Catherine. Catherine, I'm going to toss you the keys to the Carpenter Copter, and we are going to go swamping. So take us out and away from Indiana. We're going to the Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia. It's April 3rd. 2000. Don't we have a hydrofoil? The carpenter copter transforms into the... Don't we have a hydrofoil? What is it? The hair hovercraft? And now... Whoa, look at Catherine. You got four vehicles. That's... Because you're in such a disgusting and dark episode. You're driving the hair hovercraft as we're moving over the swamps of Georgia. This story was sent to the website Singular Fordian. And this article that I'm getting all my information from was written by Tobias and Emily Wayland. Uh, Singular Fortean, you'll see it in the show notes, it's a great website. There's a lot of really cool stories there. And this was sent to them by a woman named Shirley Ivy. She tells the story of what happened to her and her family on April 3rd, 2000. At the time, Shirley was 41 years old, and their family was just passing through the area, taking a little road trip. But they're familiar with swamps and the familiar with the basic landscape of where we're at so it's not like me who's a total city slicker to be like what swamp where the crocodiles at it's like neck deep in the swamp crocodiles i'm like look at all those logs with eyes those are pretty cool like i don't know nothing about swamps at all but she knows about swamps because that's going to play into this story so Shirley's hanging out with her family and they go hey look at near cars are having on the road they see the Suwannee Canal recreation area none of those words sound attraction <laughs> attractive to me recreation boo unless I'm sitting down I guess that is recreation but anyways area boo I love to be confined Suwannee Canal recreation area if you're in this area you can actually go here don't recommend it but it's between mile marker three and four of the Suwannee Canal Recreation Area. They rent a motorboat. Shirley and her family rent a motorboat. It's her, her husband, and two daughters, I believe. They're going down the canal. Now, she said the canal was fairly wide. It's not like a like a cement canal. It's like, that's like the term used. You're like, Jason, I, <laughs> I know what a swamp canal is, but I didn't. It's basically, it's like just a waterway. There's a big, wide waterway. She says there's tributaries going off every so often, but the, the for the tourists, you would just stay on this big waterway. As they're going to this area, they are told that there's a picnic area not too far down river or down swamp. So the motorboat's going, they hear a little bluegrass music playing, down on swamp with me, gonna have a good time. Boat's going down. And they are boating for a while and they don't see the picnic area. I'm like, what? 
I mean, sure, we haven't really been here before, but they said it wasn't that far. And as they're starting to think about it, they have all this picnic food. They really want to eat it. They need an area to eat it. Oh, there it is! They see the picnic area off the shore. So they pull up, mm, 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 eating their ham sandwiches, and having a good time. Having a nice little picnic, family picnic, next to the swamp. Now, as they're packing up and getting ready to leave, another boat shows up. And there are these two young men in it. And she said they look distressed. They're like, oh, they're all disheveled and stuff like that. They're like, oh, oh, they're all shaking. uh, They're shaking super fast, like how some on an ill ghost. She goes, they didn't appear to be drunk, but they looked a little disheveled. They looked like they were not having a good time. They did not have picnic baskets with them. And they go, hey, hey, guys, 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 do you have a ham sandwich for me? They're all addicted to picnics. No, they said, hey, can we follow you back? Because we seem to be lost. She thought that was weird because it's just kind of like a straightaway. She's like, yeah, sure. You can follow us back. Take your boat, we'll take our boat, and we're going to go back up river to where the recreation area is, and there you go. Kind of an odd request, though. It would be like someone saying, hey, can I follow you back? You look like both ways down the street, and you're like, it's just a one-way street. But what are you going to do? Tell them no? They follow you anyways, right? You're in a boat. How fast can you go? So her family gets in the boat. The two dudes are following them, and she says they don't go very far up river, and they hit a dead end. Both boats are just kind of sitting there in the water. She says when they went back the way they came, the waterway was blocked by land. There was like a strip of land across the shores of the canal. She said on the other side, you could actually see the canal continue, but you have this block of land. Now, this is where it's important that she knows about this stuff. She goes, listen, I know that there are these things called tussocks, which are like a a drifting mass of plants that will just appear in the swamp and kind of float down. She goes, it wasn't that. I'm familiar with that terrain. She goes, it wasn't a floating island either. She goes, this land was dry, and it had tall grass on it. Like it had been there for a while. Now, a floating island can hold trees up to 50 pounds. She goes, it wasn't that. It was part of the landscape, and it was immobile, and it was there. And it wasn't there when they came by. So they're looking at the guys in the other boat. And they, she said the men in the other boat looked at them. And they both kind of just shrugged their shoulders. Almost like that's what they expected. Almost like they had done this before. They're thinking we must have took a wrong turn somewhere. Even though this is pretty much just a straightaway. Let's go back to the picnic area. Regroup. Come back. And that's exactly what they do. And she says when we go back to the picnic area... They see, coming towards them, coming towards the two boats, a canoe. They're like, okay, that's weird. Everyone else here has motorboats, but it's not illegal to use a canoe. It's probably take a lot of upper body strength. And as the canoe's getting closer, both the people in it are elderly people. They're just rowing. And Shirley's looking at this, and her and the other boat, because they're headed back towards the picnic area, the canoe's headed towards where they were just at, and they start yelling, hey, there's a, there's a barrier there, you can't go, you're going to have to turn around. And she said they wouldn't even look at us. They just stared straight ahead as they're rowing this canoe in the direction that they were coming from. Hey, no, there's nothing, they just can't. turn around, turn around. The canoe just kept going. They get back to the picnic area, and sure enough, they were headed in the right direction. That's why they wanted to get back to the picnic area. They thought, well, maybe we just launched wrong. We hit the end. They realized they were headed in the right direction. They get back in their boats. They go back the way that they came, and not only was there no land bridge, not only was there no canoe full of elderly people, they got back to the rest stop, Far quicker than they got to the picnic area. And you go, Jason, you know, with the stream, you know, boats and the way water works and all. Yeah, sure, I get that. But it was substantially quicker. The trip to the picnic area was unusually long. And then showing back up, they're like, oh, we're here. No land bridge, no canoe, nothing. And when they get to the parking lot, they wanted to talk to the two guys in the other boat and go, hey, wasn't that weird? Like, what was going on there? She says they dropped their boat off got in their car, and took off without saying a word. She goes, we were never able to talk to them about this. So her family was left with a mystery. What really happened that day in the Okefenokee Swamp? 
it's funny because these type of stories, I think, are the scariest. I mean, getting my head chopped off by a serial killer in Japan, that's pretty terrifying too. But the idea that you could just go out into nature and get lost, even though you know the train. Again, I'm not talking about getting lost in a physical sense. They went somewhere where land was able to create itself. I mean, let's put on our conspiracy caps here. And we'll end the episode off like this. Like, they went to another place and possibly another time. The people in the motorboat, the two men in the motorboat, they had obviously been doing this journey for a while. They needed someone to guide them back. And I bet you in the back of their mind, when they see this family picnicking, they're probably thinking, oh no. Like, are they going to be trapped too? We've been at this for hours. Hours we've been lost. And when they first hit that barrier and the family's like, huh, what's going on? The two dudes are looking at each other. They're like, this sucks. I'm eating them. I'm eating them. We're just going to have to cannibalize them. And then they all get free. What about the people in the canoe who weren't at the launch when they got there? They didn't see an elderly couple jumping in their car. What happened to them? Did they go to yet another time and place in that same swamp? It was interesting because just tonight, maybe 10 minutes before I started recording this episode, I'm recording this episode real early, I'm on the X board. This guy, he works in the Pacific Northwest. Him and his buddies are doing some work in the outdoors. He's he's not given, obviously, what he does for, you know, he doesn't want to get docs or anything like that, but they're on a path in the woods, and they know there's supposed to be these subpaths breaking off of it. And they're walking, they're walking for 15 minutes, and they're lost. They don't see the subpaths they know that are there. He goes, we work this trail pretty often. We know this area. In this version, all three of these people, the OP and his two friends, both become physically ill and need to lay down to kind of regain their composure. And then, bam, they wake up. There's another guy there being like, dude, what are you doing sleeping on the job? What are you guys doing here? And he's telling this story. He goes, we were just out for this walk and we ended up a place that wasn't familiar to us even though we've been on this path several times. It wasn't right. He goes, we walked. We walked for a half hour. We could not find our way out. And there was a fourth person there who was with them, but he apparently was just standing there or walking the other direction. And when he sees the three other workers walk into a direction... The fourth guy says, I felt a funny feeling. I turned around. You guys were just gone. You guys had disappeared into the forest. It's an interesting story because you can go, these people go missing, and then we file these missing people people reports, and that's kind of, unfortunately, it a lot of times, or you find the bodies later. And so you go, Jason, can you look for missing people reports of elderly people who rented a canoe <laughs> rented a canoe that day or that week in Okefenokee Swamp. But if you're having disturbances of time and space, would you think to look for missing people's reports from 1910? Would you think of looking for missing people reports that go back so far and they're just lost in this loop, like a tape recorder that's constantly playing? Or even more terrifying, that... The people who got lost originally, it's not a it's not that an elderly couple went missing in nineteen ten. It's that a young, vibrant couple out on their honeymoon go missing. And time warps in such a way that they can exist in that realm slowly aging. They'd been there for sixty, seventy years, rowing that boat, looking for a way out. I know you're thinking, well, how did they eat? Well, maybe they're hunting squirrels. I don't know, man. You expect to make everything up? Maybe they're like, just like stabbing crocodiles. Or maybe because of the space-time continuum is so messed up, you don't have to eat nothing. You know, that, didn't you know that? So I don't know. I don't have all the answers, but I, it's spooky either way. Either there's a world where people disappear and they're missing until they're old, or there's a world where old people go missing. You don't want to live in either of those, right? And you would just be in such a survival mode. You would just keep rowing. You would keep walking. You would keep hiking through that area, desperate to find a way out. Those men could have still been lost there to this day. Just two more missing people posters 
in a post office as they slowly fade and crumble, and everyone but the family members forget about them. But in reality, they're continuing to boat through the swamp. How many people who have gone missing haven't had a horrible fate like being kidnapped or dying, but had a terrifying fate? One of living, one of existing. But they exist in a world that they can never find their way out of. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great weekend, guys. Peace.